Oh, hello there. Happy whatever day it is that you're watching this video. My name is Chelsea Seaburn. Welcome to The Smart Student. We have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna cut right to the chase. This is a video on what to do when an element is missing and you're doing APA referencing. If you want the full tutorial on APA referencing or in-text citations, check out these videos up here. But so that you know you're in the right place, let me tell you what's on the menu for this video. I'm gonna start with the four elements that all references are made up of. I'm gonna talk about the two formatting principles that APA references fall under. We're gonna talk about what to do when you're missing elements. And lastly, I wanna close with what I like to call uncommon situations that create commonly asked questions. As always, this video is timestamped, so if you don't want to watch all of that, please use those to navigate to the part that you need. But anyways, for everyone else, let's go ahead and get started. Okay friends, here we are. Like I said, I wanna start with the four elements that all references are made up of and the two different formatting principles because in order for you to understand what to do when an element is missing, you kinda gotta understand the foundation of APA referencing in general. So let's go ahead and start with the four elements. No matter what type of source you're trying to reference, you're looking for the four same things. You're looking for the author, the date, the title, and the source in that order. Now, that being said, there are two different formatting principles that those references fall under. You either have an italic title or an italic source. The italic title is gonna be for works that stand alone, and the italic source is gonna be for works that are a part of a greater whole. Now, let me explain what that means. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull up this blog post here that was actually written by the APA Association. It does a great job of describing these two formatting principles, so I'll link it down if you wanna check it out. But anyways, let's start with works that stand alone. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in on that portion of the column. So a work that stands alone simply means that that source is its own single unit. So here, you wanna think of things like books, web pages, thesis papers, dissertations, or perhaps government reports. Now, on the other side, you have works that are a part of a greater whole. And what this means is that one single source belongs to something bigger. So think of something like a journal article. That one journal article is not its own source because it belongs to a greater whole, which would be the journal in its entirety. So for that category, you want to think of things like newspapers, newsletters, magazine articles, blog posts, or perhaps podcast episodes. All of those sources, again, belong to a greater whole. Now I'm going to go ahead and zoom back out so you can see both sides. Because while this may seem like a lot to remember, here are a couple things that can make this easy for you. So if you'll notice, works that stand alone, there are a lot more than them because they're the most common, meaning that most sources are gonna follow the italic title pattern. Now, let's say a source is a part of a greater whole, but you're unsure which category it falls under. Sources that are a part of a greater whole are actually fairly easy to spot because you have to identify the greater whole. So for example, when you have to cite a journal article, this is why you also have to include the journal name, the volume number or issue number and page numbers. And it's that source information right there that would be italicized. Now, one thing that I'd like to touch on before I move on from this section, and that that is, notice how a book is listed under standalone assignment and how an edited book is listed under a work that's a part of a greater whole. This used to confuse me, which is why I'd like to add some clarity, but basically, what's the difference between a book and an edited book chapter? Now, that seems pretty self-explanatory, but again, I used to be confused, and so when it comes to a book, think of a traditional book that is written by one author. So for example, if you had to write a book report on Huckleberry Finn, that book is a standalone assignment. Now, for an edited book chapter, think of something like your textbook. Obviously, a textbook is not gonna be written by one author, not usually anyways, and so each different chapter is usually dedicated to an author or a set of authors, or perhaps those chapters might go for revisions later. Think of your psychology textbook. Perhaps as information becomes outdated, a chapter of that book may be edited for revisions later on to reflect those changes, which is why that one chapter would fall under a part of a greater whole because that single unit belongs to the entire textbook as a whole. Does that make sense? 
I'd argue that that was the most important part of this entire video because if you can remember that all references are made up of those four elements and then depending on the type of reference that'll tell you how to format it either italic source or italic title you can format just about anything but now let's go ahead and talk about what to do when an element is missing okay so what does it mean to have a missing element when referencing well like I just said all references are made up of those four elements and sometimes one might be missing so you might be trying to cite a web page that doesn't have the date listed for example so now I'm gonna walk you through this chart and of course it's down in the description if you'd like to download it yourself but fair warning I hate to go all Alexa on you but I am gonna speak this part in a pretty matter-of-factly tone so try not to fall asleep here we go Okay, so first things first, if nothing is missing, you will include all four of those elements, author, date, title, source, like you see it is listed here in the chart. Now, let's go down and let's say the author is missing. In this case, you're going to provide the title, the date, and the source in that order. In other words, the title is gonna be listed at the front of the reference where the author element would usually be listed. Now, let's say it's the date that's missing. In this case, the date is actually the most simple because you're simply gonna write the abbreviation n.d. where the date element would usually go. If you'd like to take a note though, ND is written in lowercase letters. It will always be written in lowercase letters just like you see it is right here. Now let's go ahead and move on to what you will do if the title is missing. This one is a little more complex, but again, it's still actually fairly simple. So you're going to include all of the other elements just as you would normally, meaning you're gonna write out the author, the date, and then when it comes to the title element, you're going to write a short description of the work you're trying to cite in square brackets like you see it is right here. So for example, a short description you might write would be something like, qualitative data from Amazon. Just a few words that describes the article, source, whatever it is you're trying to cite. So those are the basic principles to follow when only one element is missing. Now let's get into what to do when two or even three elements are missing. So starting with the author and the date, Basically, you're gonna combine the two principles from before. So in this case, you're gonna provide the title first in the author elements place. You're going to include the abbreviation n.d. for no date, and then you're going to include the source like normal. Now, let's say it's the author and the title that's missing. While this starts to become complex, again, you're just combining the principles from before. So in this case, you're going to describe the work in those square brackets. You're going to include it first because there is no author element, and then the rest of the reference is gonna follow as normal. In other words, you're going to include the date and the source. Now, moving on to the next one, which is when the date element and the title element are missing. You're gonna see a pattern here, but what you're gonna do is include the references normal. You're going to write n.d. for no date, and then you're going to include the description of the work in those square brackets and include the source last. Now, we have just a couple more to go over, and this next one is what to do when you're missing the author, the date, and the title. You're missing three out of the four elements, and here's the thing, as long as you have the source, you can include it in your reference list because in order for it to be a reference, the reader needs to be able to go look it up. So believe it or not, it's okay if you're missing those three elements, you can make it work. In this case, you're going to include a description of the work in brackets at the beginning. You're going to include n.d. for the date, and then you'll include the source at the end of the reference. And that leads me right into the last example of this chart, and that is, what do you do when the source is missing? Well, there are two things you can do. A, you can find a different, more appropriate source to reference in your reference list, or you can cite it as a personal communication. Now, a personal communication is simply gonna be something where the reader can't look it up. So for example, maybe this is a personal email that has information you wanna put in your paper, or perhaps a lecture from your professor that was not uploaded on the internet. As you can imagine, the reader can't look these things up if there's no place for them to find them. So in this example, what you're going to do is create no reference list entry because again, there's no way for the reader to look it up. And instead, you're going to signify that it's a personal communication in the in-text citation. 
For that citation, you're going to include the communicator's information, starting with their first initial, middle initial, followed by their last name. After that, you will write the word personal communication in lowercase letters. You're going to include the month, day, year of the personal communication you're trying to cite, and it's as simple as that. Now, I did include one more in here, and it's not an official missing element that's included in the APA chart, but I wanted to touch on it because I know I ran into this quite a few times, and that is, what do you do when the periodical information is missing? So in other words, let's say you have a journal article and either the volume number, issue number, or page numbers are missing. Although the page numbers should never really be missing. But that being said, maybe it's an online article and one of those elements is missing. What do you do? Well, this is very simple. If any one or all or two of those elements are missing, you're simply going to omit them, meaning you're just not going to list them. So if the volume number is not included, don't include it in the paper and continue with the issue number and the page number like you normally would. Let me pull up an example real quick, simply so you can see what I mean. But in these three, each one is missing one of these elements, either the volume number, issue number, or page number. And as you can see, they're simply left out from the reference list entry and that's okay. Well, that was fun. I had fun. Did you have fun? Fine. Okay. Maybe we have different ideas of fun, but now let's go ahead and move on to those uncommon situations that create those commonly asked questions. Again, I hate to go all Alexa on you. Actually, scratch that. Let's give Siri some love. I hate to go all Siri on you, but again, try not to fall asleep. Here we go again. All right, so here we are again. The way this section of the video is gonna work is I have a full list of examples for every scenario I'm about to go over. So that way, as I'm talking about them, you can see what I mean. But anyways, let's start with scenario number one. And it's number one because it's the most common question I get. And that is, what do you do when you're citing a source that contains information that was originally said by someone else somewhere else? Now, first, this is called citing a secondary source. The source that you found the information in is considered the secondary source, and the original source is considered the primary source. In this situation, you have two options. One, if you can find the original source, go ahead and find it and cite it as a primary source. Very simple. Now, let's say you can't find the original source very easily. Maybe it was said a long time ago, maybe it's and a lot of different sources, whatever the case may be, what you're going to do is create a reference list entry for the secondary source, and then you're going to identify the primary source in your in-text citation. So what this would look like, as you can see in this example, let's say you're reading an article and the author of the secondary source is something Smith, and he's quoting a famous quote by John F. Kennedy. Well, obviously John F. Kennedy said it first, he would be the primary source. And in the NTEC citation, what you're going to do is include Kennedy's last name first, write out as cited by Smith, and then include the date element like normal. For a narrative in-text citation, it's gonna follow the same principles as if it were a traditional narrative in-text citation, but again, you're going to identify that this is a secondary source by including the phrase, as cited by, in this example, as cited by Smith, 2021, who expressed the need, blah, 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 there's the quote, and then there's the page number in which the reader could go look up that source. This is actually a fairly simple fix for again, one of those uncommon situations. Let me know if you have any questions about that, but let's go ahead and move on to the next example. So in scenario number two, what do you do if the group author and the source are the same? So again, this is actually pretty common, but for example, your group author is the name of an organization, you're on a web page, and that name of the organization is also the name of the website, aka the name of the source. What do you do? Do you list it out twice for each element? And the answer is no. You're simply gonna list it out once as the author element and then omit the naming portion of the source element. So you would still include the source, which would be the URL or the DOI, so the reader can look it up. However, you don't need to include the organization name twice because it's considered redundant. And it could also be confusing. So in this example here, if you were to look up this URL, Canadian Cancer Society is the group author and it's also the name of this website. As you can see here, the entire reference list entry is as it should be, except there is no website listed because Canadian Cancer Society is both the group author and the name of the website. 
Again, let me know if you have any questions on any of these situations as I go through them. But now let's go ahead and move on to the next situation. So in this one, what do you do if you're citing multiple sources in one citation? So let's say you paraphrase a long sentence and it contains information from three different articles. Fairly simple, you're going to create the in-text citation that follows the rules of citing more than one study at a time. The question I get a lot though is what order do you put those authors in? And simply, you're gonna put them in the same order as the reference list. In other words, you're going to list them out alphabetically. As you can see here, this example contains three different authors and they are listed by alphabetical order in regards to the author's last name. Very simple. Now, what if instead of citing multiple sources in one citation, you're citing one source multiple times? Now, this is another fairly common question, and I love the answer to it because it's so simple. So for example, let's say you're writing a book report on one book. You refer to that book, let's say 10 times, and your question is, do I create 10 different citations for it? What do I do? The answer is no you create the one reference list entry because it's only one source, and then you're simply gonna differentiate the different parts you're referring to in your in-text citations with the source locators. So if you're using a book, you're going to include page numbers. If you're watching a movie documentary, you're going to include timestamps from the different times you're referring to. Again, very simple fix. I find this is most common when someone's writing a research paper and they're doing research in their textbook and they refer to it a bunch of different times, again, one reference list entry and you're going to differentiate with the source locators in your in-text citations like you see they are here in this example. Now let's talk about what to do when you're citing sources that contain similar elements, either the same author or the same date. So starting with what do you do when you have multiple sources that contain the same author? So let's say you're on a website and you want to cite a few different articles, but they're all written by the same person. What do you do? Again, this is simple. If the date is different, you're simply going to create citations as you would normally because the date is going to signify that they're different articles. Now, the only thing to note here is that if you're creating reference list entries for an author multiple times, meaning they have the same last name, how do you alphabetize them? Well, you're going to use the publication date. So in other words, in this example, you would start with the citation that has no date that will always come first if you have one. And then you would go in order from 2019 to 2021. Now let's talk about what to do if the author and the publication date is the same. So this is definitely less common, but I'm going to include it here because I have been asked about it quite a few times. And let's go back to the web page example. So you have one author, or in this case, two authors in this example, that house this website and they're putting out articles and two articles they put out in the same year, but they don't include any other date elements such as the month or the day. So all you have are the same last names and the same year as the date element. How do you differentiate between those? Well, very simple. And as you can see right here, you're going to show that they're different by including a lowercase letter right behind the date element. And if you notice, they're going to be in alphabetical order because you want it to match your reference list entry. So these first two are the in-text citations. I've included a narrative one just so you can see the differences between the two. But as you can see, the first one has a lowercase a, the second one has a lowercase b. Here's the beginning of what the reference list entries would look like, and there's the lowercase a and the lowercase b, so the reader can see which in-text citation corresponds with its relevant reference list entry. That was a mouthful. Again, let me know if that made sense. I hope these are making sense to you. They make sense to me, but that doesn't mean they make sense to you. So feel free to leave me questions. Okay, yay, I have two more things that I wanna cover. So stick with me if you've made it this far, we're almost there. Yay. I wanna talk about abbreviations. So I'm sure you're already aware that if you're using an organization or something that has an abbreviation of the longer phrase, you can use it. What you would do is you would write out the full name. In this example, you would write out World Health Organization, and then you would include the abbreviation, which is WHO, in the first time you use it. Because then, in the rest of your paper, anytime you say World Health Organization, you can just write out WHO rather than writing out the full word. Great. The question here is, what do you do if you have two phrases that contain the same abbreviations? 
Again, this is rare, but I've been asked about it quite a few times, so I'm gonna talk about it. Guys, it's pretty simple. Basically, you can do route number one, which is not abbreviate either of them, so that way the reader can tell which one is which every time they read it, or you're welcome to abbreviate one of them, probably the one you use the most, and then not abbreviate the other one, because that way the reader can still tell the difference between which is which. Now, keep in mind this rule stands true for referencing, citation creating, and general APA formatting. So it doesn't have to be in an in-text citation for you to follow these rules. If you have two phrases in your paper, two organizations you're referring to, for example, that have the same abbreviation, you can follow these guidelines as well. But let's go ahead and move on to the last point I'd like to cover, and that is, what do you do if your professor counts you off for plagiarism, but you included an in-text citation and a proper reference list entry? So the cold hard truth of this question is that if you receive that feedback, it means you didn't paraphrase correctly or enough. It's as simple as that. The reason I'm bringing up now is because it falls into the category of referencing and creating in-text citations, but the common question I get asked a lot is a student will come to me and say, I got flagged for plagiarism, but I included an in-text citation. And so first things first, just because you include an in-text citation and a reference list entry does not mean that you're automatically covered. You have to follow the appropriate guidelines for paraphrasing or direct quoting. So you either have to paraphrase correctly or you have to include the information as a direct quote. And if you're going to include it as a direct quote, that means it has to be included verbatim, word for word, and it has to follow the formatting principles for a direct quote. Now, if you need help with paraphrasing, go ahead and check out this video up here, but something to keep in mind is that your professor usually isn't counting you off to, you know, be difficult. They probably ran your paper through a plagiarism checker and it got flagged and so their hands are tied. They have to mark you off. Just keep that in mind. But anyways, that was all of my uncommon situations that create commonly asked questions. Before I move on, I wanna open up a space of, if you have any other reference list questions, in-text citations, anything that falls under this umbrella, go ahead and comment them down below, and I'll either do my best to answer them there or keep them for a future video topic. All right, friends, here we are. What did I tell you? Not so bad, right? or just kidding, it was horrible and you hate me right now. Anyways, I'm happy you are here regardless. I hope you learned something. If you did learn something, let me know what that was down in the comment section below. I love to hear from all of you guys. I do my best to respond to most of you. But in the meantime, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, subscribe for more videos like this every week. Thank you.